Greetings, everyone. P. Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Album Homework Assignment. It's Sunday. We're a little later than we anticipated here today. We apologize for that. But as my mother always told me, better late than never. We've got in the co-captain's chair today, going head to head, Sean Torar and Eric Porter. Jesus, my throat gives out on me there. Good evening, gentlemen. How Good are evening. You? How's it hey, going? Pete. Doing good. Doing good. Anticipating snow and then lots of rains, which means the snow ain't going to stay around for too long, but that's okay. So uh, that's weather in New York in the wintertime. So well, I hope you're in the mood for bread and milk. <clears throat> yes, because uh, <laughs> you know, bagels and milk, maybe. I don't know. You never have enough of those. Who knows? Supplies, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Sean and Eric have both had their albums that they've given each other for about a week, uh, as we always do on this show. Neither one has heard the albums before that they were given, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what they got. So, uh, Sean, what were you given by Mr. Porter to listen to here for this exercise? I was given a band that I had heard about for many years. I probably first heard them back in the early 80s and probably never heard another song by them at all. Um, it, although I probably checked them out a couple of times on YouTube, but nothing really stuck with me. So this was the first time I really dug into one of their albums. And um, it's a group from Canada that was contemporaries with Rush. They toured together a lot. They're called Max Webster with uh, Kim Mitchell on guitar and vocals. Really awesome guitar player. Very underrated. And uh, the album, it turned out to be their third album. It's called Mutiny Up My Sleeve. It's from 1978. There it is. And... Um, First thing I noticed when I started checking out the credits was it was produced by Terry Brown, who produced Rush's albums, like all the way up through Signals. So this was 1978. This was right around the time Rush was doing Hemispheres, and uh, you know he was producing both of them. And I'd say there's a kind of a similar sonic kind of sound going on, so you can kind of tell it was produced by the same guy. Um, the cover's uh, done by Hugh Syme, who has done Rush's cover since... Caress of Steel, I think, and does them for all kinds of people nowadays, you know, Dream Theater and people in that ballpark. Yeah, this one, not his most dramatic work, but but cool yeah. looking. <laughs> A little minimalist, you're, right? You're right. Yeah. He would go on to be kind of the modern day hypnosis guy, you know. Um, you know, hypnosis was that team out of England that did Wish You Were Here and so many great 70s covers. And Hughes kind of like that with these kind of surreal landscapes where big things are little, little things are big, and it kind of messes with your head when you look at it. He hadn't got to around to that yet when he did this album cover, but um, you know who that is. Um, and some of these lyrics are written by a guy named Pai Dubois, who uh, co-wrote a few Rush songs with Neil, Closer to the Heart, I think, or maybe um, Tom Sawyer, I can't maybe remember Tom now, Sawyer, but yeah. it's Tom Sawyer, okay, cool. So anyway, you know, some good lyrics um, sprinkled in here, and uh, I thought it was really cool. You know, it was kind of fusiony. It kind of reminded me of um, Zappa at his more wacky, uh, or Todd Rundgren at his more wacky. You know, these guys were a lot like that. I thought um, the tunes are really kind of intricately arranged, intricate, intricately arranged, which I like because I like songs that keep you guessing and, and surprise you and. These songs, you know, just have, are just chock full of great riffs and parts, and they, they fly by you pretty quick. Like, um, compared to Rush, there's a lot more content coming at you quicker, I think. Um, Rush has a way of kind of picking four, four or five parts and really kind of playing them until they kind of exhausted them and moving on to the next thing. These guys just flitter from one thing to the next, and it, it I don't know, it's, it's exciting, but it's a little... A little um add at the same time i guess you know when it comes to arranging but that's cool anybody that likes fusion and that sort of thing i think would enjoy this and i got a kick out of it um i and it was pretty funny and i, I kim mitchell's a really great singer awesome guitar player kind of reminded me a bit of zappo or rundgren but maybe a little more tidy than either one of them <laughs> uh so but kind of in that ballpark another SG player. And um, so how did you guys get into these guys? You know, I mean, I just, you know, I heard the one song, Battle Scar. I remember the, the cover with 
Kim in the yellow jumpsuit. And it's like, you know, it's like, check this out, man. Rush is guesting on this song. And, and we listened to it and it was like, yeah, you know, that's you definitely Rush. <laughs> I, uh, Sean, when I went to college, uh, I went to SUNY Potsdam, which is uh, upstate, upstate New York. So it was pretty close to the Canadian border. And a lot of people on the, so this was mid 80s. And just a lot of people that I knew, I joined the radio station when I got up there and ended up meeting a guy. And this was one of his bands and actually probably got more into Kim's solo stuff first than Max Webster. But um, that was really my introduction was college, um, you know, and I sounds funny now, but I taped all their albums because the radio station had everything and and uh, listened to those for years and and um, just really was blown away, you know, by both his guitar playing and his and his singing. Um, I just thought he was great. And like you said, they're very quirky um, and they kind of touch a little bit of everything. You'll get pop, you get the fusion, you get prog you get straight ahead hard rock. Um, so I just felt like they did a lot of everything and that may have gone against them because they were very hard to classify, but obviously they toured, like you said, they toured with Rush. Rush brought them out a lot. I think a number of tours they played with Rush. So, you know, they really, they were out there. They just kind of played second fiddle to them. I think at that point, like you said, same producer, I think they had the same management. They were on the same label. So, you know, um, but that was my introduction to them was in college. So, yeah, I mean, I got I've heard about them for years. And, you know, before I started going to see shows in like 81, I mean, they were opening up for Rush pretty much every tour that came to the New York area. But again, this is Rush prior to playing in like hockey arenas. Right. So this is Rush playing in the smaller you know, 2,000 to 5,000 seat halls, which is where they were like in the latter half of the of the 70s. And they brought Max Webster out with them quite a bit, but I wasn't going to see shows then. So by the time I started going to see concerts, um, you know, Rush were playing the bigger arenas, you know, Madison Square Garden, the Meadowlands, Giants, you know, all that kind of stuff. And Matt, that was the end of the tour with Max Webster. But actually Max Webster was a band were pretty much done by then. So I had always heard the name. And I think the only song I really remember hearing on the radio uh, that was played around here was Paradise Skies, which was which is a really nice song. It's kind of like it's like a hard rock song, but it's got a great hook. I always thought they I always thought they were the tubes to be to be quite frank. That's because they remind me a little bit of them as well. Sure. But it wasn't until about like a decade ago where I, you know, I just said, you know what, I need to investigate this band. And then I found that they only had like a handful of albums and I picked them up really quick and I, I fell in love with the band. And it's again, like Eric said, there's a lot to like about these guys, but they're just, they're so different. They're so quirky. And I think if you look back on the history of rock, a lot of these bands who did a little bit of everything never really made it that big because people have a hard time grasping so much variety in, you know, a band's music. I mean, on every album, every song sounds completely different than the song that came before it. It's like, well, are they hard rock? Are they pop? Are they prog? Are they fusion? Are, you know, are they any of those? I don't know. Right. But, um, and it's a shame because I think really talented and what Sean was saying before, it's like there, there's a lot going on on these songs. And if you really like, you know, pretty intricate musical arrangements, but lots of hooks, it doesn't get much better than this. Right. I think so. You know, I was really impressed. Um, it was it lived up to the, my expectations after hearing about them for so many years. And um, it makes me curious to hear the rest. And I'm kind of curious how their discography unfolds and, and changes or like how many albums did they have? And um, when did they quit making them? And is it they... five, Pete? Five yeah, it's, studio? It's five studio albums, a live album, an EP, and like a greatest hits that has like one or two, you know, new tracks at the time they released that after they were done so yeah we're, we're talking at, we're looking at uh 76 to 82 so it's not a not a long period of time how would you say they evolved over the course of those five records well i mean the music is fairly similar from album to album but the albums don't sound alike does that make any sense at all like they didn't go through drastic changes like rush did for instance but you know like the the earlier albums are definitely a little more proggy the latter albums, like I would say Universal, Universal Juveniles and um, 
I guess a million, million vacations, maybe. Yeah, are a little heavier, like a little less keyboardy, a little more guitar rock type stuff. Um, I mean, for me personally, I I think High Class and Borrowed Shoes is an absolute classic, and this was from uh, that's the uh, second album, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's but they're all really, really good. So it really, you know, wherever you start with is is a good place to start with. But um, yeah. They just, I, you know what it is? They, they weren't together long enough, I think, to really kind of start to evolve into doing other things. It's like they, they, they came out one album after another, after another, not a lot of break in between. And so you get these, this handful of albums that each one is very different from the next, but they're not so stylistically different that you say, oh, wow, well, that's a quick, complete departure. It's not like you're going from like hemispheres or, or permanent waves to signals or, you know, then grace under bread. There's nothing like that. It's almost like you've got like a permanent waves of moving pictures and, uh, and maybe a couple others like that, right. That they all kind of stay in a similar type of a place, but every album is chock full of songs that sound very different from each other. I don't know if that makes any sense at all, but that's... Did they ever do a reunion? Yeah. Uh, not in terms of albums, but I know they've done shows. Yeah. And not anything big. They haven't gotten together, I think, and gone back out and toured. But I know in Canada, I think in Toronto, they've gotten together a couple times, maybe late 2000s, Pete, might be the last one. It's been a while, yeah. I don't even know if it's 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 more than a decade, I would think. Okay, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, so which uh, which songs did you like on this on this particular one? They, they really jump out. Uh, you, there's a few that kind of stuck with me. I thought the opener lip service was really cool. Yeah. It had a bit of a deep purple vibe and a really killer guitar solo. And at the end, there's like this killer keyboard solo that is much too short. It's like this guy just starts ripping and then the song is over. They could have just gone another minute, but really cool stuff. Um, I thought Astonish Me was a really nice ballad. A lot of cool synths and stuff. Um, I thought it had a bit of a 10cc vibe. And I, I, love, I love 10cc, so it was great. Um, really cool changes, kind of a proggy middle section with the synth solo too. So that's always fun. And um the guitar solo, that chord progression under it kind of made me think of Genesis at the end. So uh, check it out, folks. It's pretty cool. And uh, the party, that's a pretty cool up-tempo rocker with some yeah. Zappa-esque twists and turns. Awesome middle section with maybe the coolest solo on the whole record. And that's saying something because all of his solos are really good. Yeah, he's a good player. Um, yeah. and, um, and the last tune was pretty darn epic, Beyond the Moon. Kind of a, starts with what I call it a quick ethnic music fake out and then breaks into something completely different. Um, really symphonic with big synths and spooky vocals. Real epic middle section with a ripping guitar solo and epic synths. And a really epic ending with quick arpeggiating guitar over this really cool chord progression. Um, almost like Freebird or something, but but <laughs> but a lot cooler and kind of fusion. Um, but that's interesting, yeah. Sean. Freebird played by Alan Holdsworth, maybe you know he's got that legato going at the end of that song. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But you know what I mean? It's just like this yeah. really persistent arpeggio thing that keeps climbing around, and it's it, it's pretty ripping. Like it's a it. great, great track. Yeah, it's yeah. one of my favorite songs by then. Actually, yeah, it's a good one. And when you bring up Zappa, I've watched a bunch of interviews with him and uh he mentioned zappa and uh captain beefheart a lot okay and yeah you can hear it in there kind of influences. You know? i mean so yeah i mean and you mentioned the tubes i think that's another great one it is a good like one. zappa tubes rundgren all are kind of these really talented people that can play circles around most bands but they do it in the service of these really quirky humorous tunes yeah. that are that are you know humorous lyrically maybe vocally sometimes and also instrumentally like some of those arrangements you just know they were just cracking up as they were putting it together you know <laughs> just like, this is ridiculous cool let's do it <laughs> you know, it's kind of, and they had a lot of fun doing it too i'm sure sure and it's just fun to listen to it i'm sure live it's a blast yeah cool well Sounds like a winner there. So uh, we'll, we'll circle back at the end for both of your, uh, you know, final thoughts and, and about these albums. So, uh, Eric, what were you given by Sean? 
Well, I like how Sean, it, it's nice that he picked up on that. And I know you're a musician, Sean. So with the talent, so I was given, Sean and I had a nice conversation. We kind of talked a bit in terms of, you know, trying to find something for each other. And in terms of talent, what we ended up um, deciding on and Sean gave me was uh, David Sanctious and the album is uh, Forest of Feelings. And if you want to talk about talent, I mean, let's just run through. We've got Peter Gabriel, we have uh, John Anderson, Sting, and of course, everyone probably knows the name from him being a member of the original E Street Band with Bruce Springsteen. Um, this guy's just been in demand. He's toured with so many people. He's played on so many records. Um, just an absolute talent. And this album is his first solo release. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting in reading about him, um, I knew his name and obviously I knew he played with Springsteen and a, and a few others. Um, but when I read about him, what I thought was really interesting was that Springsteen actually worked to get him his record contract. And you're thinking when a guy leaves your band, it's usually not on the best terms. So number one, you're thinking, obviously they had a good relationship. And I think he did a lot of arranging for Springsteen too in those early days. You know, Springsteen had a lot of those longer songs and there was some complexity to those songs back in the early days. But I thought that was pretty cool that Springsteen would actually go out there and try to find something for this guy in terms of a record deal. Um, and in terms of the album, um, my take on it was there's, I would classify it in probably three different ways in listening to the songs. I'm hearing fusion. Um, and with that, I'm hearing a lot of progressive influence. I'm hearing a lot of classical in his, uh, in his piano playing. Um, and obviously there's some jazz in there too. Um, but this, it's so going through this, I'm hearing a lot of ELP. So if we start the title or the title track, I think is very fusion-y, Forest, um, uh, Forest of Feelings. And that's actually side two. But that seems to me kind of more of like a Mahavishnu uh, influence there. And when I listen to a lot of the playing on this record, the actual opener, the I think it's Sweet Cassandra, a lot of ELP influence. But there's so much piano that runs through this. And obviously Emerson had his classical influences. I get a lot of Keith Emerson from Sanctious. Um, there's just so much of that. His piano playing is not only melodic, but it's so intricate and so brilliant. And then as I'm going through this uh, album, I'm like, wow, who's this guitar player? Well, it's David, it's David Sanctious. Um, and unfortunately for me, and, and not unfortunately in a bad way, there's two tracks that are kind of funky. And that's really where the guitar comes out. It's the second track. And I'm just reading my notes here. Come on, if you feel up to it. And I believe the other one is one time. And that's on side two. And so his guitar playing really is prominent on those two tracks, which are probably the funkiest tracks on the record. But brilliant. I mean, he's an amazing guitar player. And, you know, obviously you're thinking, I think most of his role um, when he's gone out on the road with people has been as a keyboardist, um, but top notch guitar player. I Absolutely. just wish there was more on this record. It's pretty, it's a pretty heavily keyboard based album, but when the guitar does come out, it shines. Um, and one of the things that I did want to bring up, Sean, with you was, I know you had him on your show, uh, your show, Soul Night Live. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe it's the track that ends side one, Dixie. He took the traditional arrangement of that. Um, and it was very interesting in your interview with him. It was right at the end of the interview. And he talked about how that was, um, I believe it's kind of his, it's a statement as to, you know, the South and slavery. And he took a really dark twist with that arrangement. And it's basically him saying, you know, everything wasn't great in the South and it wasn't whistling Dixie. It was, there's a dark period that, um, and it's kind of his social commentary on that, which I thought was interesting. And I didn't know if you'd want to interject since you actually had the interview with him as to kind of his take on that song. Well, sure. You know, uh, you know, it kind of surprised me when I first heard it, you know, at first it was like, I know this melody, what is this? And right. then I looked at the back of the record and it's like, no way. And, you know, that's just, you know, that's like, 
like Turkey in the Straw or something, man. You know, it's that kind of melody, you know, it's just kind of a little kind of happy little ditty, you know, and, you know, he took it and changed it to a minor key to give it kind of a morose quality for starters. And it almost becomes like kind of a dirge, but it doesn't stay that way for long. He keeps taking this melody and bringing it back around in different settings. And it really goes through a lot of really prog fusion kind of changes and tempo changes. It speeds up, it slows down. Um, but yeah, he said, you know, you know, it was like, you know, it, it just made me realize, okay, well, you know, there's more than, you know, as I knew, you know, there's more than one side of the story when it comes to the history of the South. And if you're approaching it from a black man's perspective, then yeah, I'm sure it's probably not a happy thing. So this seems fitting considering what he was trying to accomplish, I think, which was just to kind of take and show an opposite end of the spectrum um, when it came to reality back then. Um, so, yeah, very, very interesting way to go about it. And uh, he makes a really compelling piece of music out of it in the end that can be enjoyed regardless if you know the background story or not. You know, it's, it's really cool. Absolutely. And that was a good interview, by the way, Sean. I really enjoyed watching that. Thanks. You know, it was a treat to get to talk to him. He's such, oh, sure. he's just like one of the most revered side men around you know like him and like tony levin and a couple other people you know that stature and that resume and uh yeah i was watching him recently you know he toured sting you know, um he's on the soul cages album and then they went out and toured as a four piece it was just sting dominique miller vinnie caliuta and and david sanctious and they sound like an eight piece band i mean it's it's huge sounding so check it out it's it's out there and then, of course, he was on the next album, Ten Summoner's Tales, also, which is one of my favorite Sting albums. It's definitely one of his best ones. Um, and then, of course, he was toured with Peter Gabriel on the So Tour, which yep. is another amazing tour. And I think he played on some of the, the album and the next one as well. So, yeah, I mean, he's just been, popped up and been part of a lot of my favorite albums by other artists. And, you know, I ran across this one one day at the record store and it's like that's about time I checked his stuff out I mean I was kind of aware of his his chops and abilities as a guitar player too but uh, I'd never actually heard his music and when I took it home and played it I was just like wow you know this is like almost like Return to Forever or something you know it's it's that caliber of fusion so if, yeah. if you like that kind of stuff you I think you'd really like David's stuff too because at least what I've heard so far and now I want to collect it all <laughs> Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I was really impressed. And I think it's just the number of influences that come in. And yeah, everything fits. His piano playing is absolutely gorgeous. I think there's a couple really tracks, is. Joyce, number eight, and East India, I think is, is another one where that one's almost like new agey. It's got kind of a Far Eastern mystical feel to it. But his piano playing is just brilliant. And Oh, yeah. I mean, he has a few albums that are just piano that are really awesome, too. I forget the names of them now. But great stuff just to put it in perspective uh so it was within the span of a couple of years in 73 he was on mm -hmm. readings from asbury park new jersey the wild the innocent and the east street shuffle and born to run by springsteen so that's 73 to 75 he also he released forest of feelings david sanctus transformation and dance of the age of enlightenment and true stories which are all solo things all within a couple of years at the same time he also appeared on Stanley Clark's Journey to Love and School Days, 75 and 76. So oh, every man. one of those albums that I just mentioned are top notch, right? And that's not even counting the stuff in the 80s and the 90s and going forward. So, you know, this guy has played on some serious stuff. And Pete, were any of those, because um, I've seen David Sanctious and Tone, are those all solo albums you listed or are those? Uh, uh, Transformation and Dance of the Age of Enlightenment and True Stories are all David Sanctious and Tone. Okay. Uh, I, they're basically solo albums, except he's playing with the same group of guys on all those albums, but they all came out right around the same time. So, you know, he got the, those three albums, Force to Feelings, David Sanctious, and then Just As I Thought was 79, but they, they all came out right around the same time. So the guy was just recording like crazy. I yeah. think, you know, the way to end my thoughts on this, obviously, I think I've brought up most of the songs, but again, going out and reading about him and watching your interview.
interview with him, Sean, was uh, Peter Gabriel was quoted, I think, as saying he's uh, the musician's musician. So you don't get a higher compliment than that in terms of a play, as being a player. But, you know, when you think about, I think what Pete said in that span of time as a writer, arranger, putting his band together, playing with these other musicians, that's a that's a, a lot of music in a pretty short chunk of time. Um, and, you know, what I've heard from this album is just quality. You know, top I'm glad notch. you liked it. Well, it's kind of... Uh, it's been my path. Uh, probably the last four or five months have really kind of been delving into fusion. And I know you and I discussed that. So it was up my alley, but I had not heard anything in terms of his solo music. So uh, it was definitely a treat to get to hear this. Well, that's great. You know, I hope this show can introduce people to his music if possible. And the same goes for Max Webster. I, I think both artists are kind of under the radar for a lot of folks. So. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. So the question I must ask both of you. Uh, so Eric, would you would you buy this one? Sounds like you might. Would you just maybe well, do it online? Or I don't think you're going to forget this one, right? I just got it on eBay tonight. So <laughs> it'll be on its way. So it, it was a buy for me, for sure. And uh, thank you for bringing up the other ones, Pete, because uh, I'll be looking at grabbing those as well. Cool. And Sean, uh, you and uh, Max Webster? So you can be, yeah, I'm looking to get a home. copy of this. Definitely. I mean, it makes me want to check out the rest. You mentioned that there's the, the party box that allows you to get all the albums at one time and some live stuff as well. And that's one party I'd like to attend. So yeah. we'll see what happens. This is a good one. Good little box set. They're all remastered and uh, bonus tracks and cool stuff. And plus you got uh, the Kim Mitchell EP in here as well. So definitely worth getting. So that last little bit of trivia the E Street Band is named after the street that David Sanctius's mother's house was on, house the in neighborhood he grew up in, and apparently they were coming home from a, a gig or something, a rehearsal like dawn almost, and like the sun hit the street light or the street sign in a certain way, and Bruce is like, the E Street Band, that's it, and the rest is history. So see that so this legendary band, the name is tied to Mr. David Sanctions. Yeah. So pretty cool. It's pretty cool pretty stuff. Cool. So yeah, check his stuff out. I think you'll be quite impressed. Yeah. I would, I would second that. So cool. All righty. Well, there you have it. We've had some homework, uh, winning, winning choices on both ends. So for everybody watching, please go investigate these two albums or any other things from the catalog of both David Sanctions and Max Webster. And uh, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn the time. Damn uh, time. All the damn time. And uh, please go check out uh, Sean's uh, Soul Night Live YouTube channel. Got uh, What do you got coming up over there? Uh, you know, I'm working on a couple things, but I haven't pinned them down yet. But they're, they're people you've definitely heard of. And um, if you're interested in interviews with uh, prog rock and fusion musicians, check out my channel, backslash SOAL Nightlive over at YouTube. And give me a sub. Check it out. We got over 100 episodes. Um, you're bound to see some people you know over there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're interested in guys like David Sanctus and Billy Cobham and Chester Thompson and guys like that, uh, Sean's been talking to him, so. I forgot to bring that up. Billy Cobham actually produced that record, Forest of Feelings. Oh, wow. Oh, so, wow. That's awesome. I didn't even realize that. I didn't. I completely slipped my mind until Pete just mentioned it, but yep, he's part Very of that cool. as well. So yeah, more Billy fusion. Cobham's there you go. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, as far as Eric, you can see him uh, every so often on In the Proxy here on Sea of Tranquility, as well as his reviews over on seatranquility.org, the webzine uh, where we've got over 23,000 reviews, just over 20 years now on the internet. So lots, lots to celebrate with that. And, yeah, congrats. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, 20 years, man. 20, the internet is like 100 years, years in real time. I guess yeah. sometimes seems like, <laughs> sometimes seems like a hundred years. Like, Oh my God. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. So uh, stay tuned here on the channel. We've got uh, geez, tomorrow is Monday night. You know what that means? Hudson Valley squares in the house tomorrow. We're uh, continuing on our January album wars battle. Looking back at 1982, 40 years of heavy metal classics tomorrow. We've got motorhead iron fist going head to head against 
Venom's Black Metal. So stay tuned for that tomorrow. We've got uh, In the Prog Seat happening on Tuesday, where we're going to be ranking the solo albums of Mr. Roger Waters. Wednesday is New Album Review Day. Thursday is The Monsters Den. Friday morning at the Funhouse with Martin Popoff. And uh, Saturday, we've got the UK Connection with uh, Stephen Reed and Simon Bray. And then on Sunday, we're right back here with album homework assignment. I believe next week is Ryan Scow from the Hudson Valley Squares going head to head with Craig Kaminsky. I'm pretty sure that's what we're doing next week. So stay tuned for that and a lot more here at the channel. We've got uh, album rankings, top 10 songs, rants, all sorts of fun stuff. So uh, please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell because you don't want to miss anything, right? So for Sean Tonar and Eric Porter, I am Pete Pardo. Good night, everybody. Good night.